Ron DeSantis is making a very big run, you know, for, for being like the culture war president. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to work. John Ronson, hello there. Hi, Dale. So nice to see you. You too. Um, the debutant is brilliant. It's fantastic. It's it's a, a classic piece of John Ronson storytelling, and um, and also I think I think in 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 the sort of same vein as a lot of what you do, you know, one of the real stories of our times, whilst also not being a story of our times, being a story mm. of a long time ago. Yeah. Well, something creeps up in the debutant, which is that, and this has been really obsessing me for a couple of years, and it wasn't what I set out to make in this story about this, you know, mysterious Tulsa debutant from the 1990s. But in America right now, there's a big argument going on, which is, are we on the cusp of civil war? Yeah. There's a lot of you know academics and historians who are convinced that the white power movement is much more unified and connected than we like to think. They're not just you know disparate lone wolves. They're really united and they're talking and they're plotting against us. And so we have to proactively do something about it. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, like a big thing to say. And unexpectedly, that comes, that sort of comes up during the debutante. Like the story of Carol Howe, this mysterious woman kind of speaks to that, this to this question that's a very important question for today. Yeah. And so, okay, and we'll come to that because there's, there's a lot to unpick there, isn't there? Yes. About, uh, and, and of course, a sort of sense around the Oklahoma bombing and whether the whether the uh, Oklahoma bomber was a lone wolf or mm. whether there was a network of people. And, and I think we should start with Carol Ho and this, and, and obviously the, the sort of centre of your story. But I was also really fascinated by her origin story. Oh, yeah. And how she um, effectively sort of fell into Nazism or, or, came, yeah. or came to it, right? And there's a story about her uh, falling off a park or falling in a park, basically, yeah. right? Yes, yes, yes. So she's with her first husband, Greg, uh, who the only p- person who's ever interviewed Greg other than the FBI is me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was so great. And she was, you know, she met at that Halloween party in 1993 and he's a yeah, handsome stoner drifter and she just, you know, sweeps him off his feet. They get married within three weeks. You know, she's a wealthy Tulsa debutante, um, very beautiful, charismatic, smart. He's this yeah, handsome um, drifter stoner. And she convinces him to get matching swastika tattoos. <laughs> As you <laughs> which, do. <laughs> which he immediately regrets the next day. Like, yeah. you know, the things you do for love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now he's had his swastika tattoo like, covered over. Now he's kind of covered it in all swirls and flowers, which, to be honest, makes it look like an effeminate swastika. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they were out in the park one day getting drunk. Uh, and it was at Easter and there was a passion play stage in this park in Tulsa. And these little kids, white kids, that becomes important later yeah. on, uh, were jumping off the thing. So Carol's like, I'm going to jump off. So she jumps off, lands on her feet and breaks both of her feet. Um, so now she's like recuperating in bed and Greg is uh, running errands for her, kind of devoted and she is listening to a telephone answering service, this is pre-internet, called Dial a Racist. <laughs> and there's a particular racist. <laughs> and it turns out his name is Dennis Mahan, but she didn't know that. Um, who would, like, record these outgoing messages about, you know, the Jews and blah. And other racists would phone in and listen, and that's how they got their daily dose of racism. Yeah. So she, <laughs> she kind of just... You know, um, a little bit. What's that movie when, you know, she falls... Oh, play Misty for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, uh, she just falls in love with this voice and then yeah. dumps dumps Greg and starts going out with him. Yeah. And there was something there was something really familiar about that in, in so much as, um, you know, having time on your hands, being kind of stuck somewhere um, and, and, you, and sort of being gripped by a toxic ideology. Pandemic. It's the pandemic. Yeah, it's, it's the story time. of the pandemic. It's true. I never thought of that, but yeah, absolutely. And right. the people who we lost during the pandemic, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She absolutely. Well, that's another thing that's just obsessing me of late. Why? What is happening that so many people? It's like invasion of the body snatchers. So many people. A lot of people of my age, I think, mm. in their you know, forties, fifties. Um, I don't know if it's a combination of the algorithms, the echo chambers. The fact that they don't like the idea that there's another generation coming up to, yeah, you know, we did it to our elders. We, 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 you know, tried to right out what we perceived to be the wrongs, and now it's happening to our generation. And people are like, 
losing their minds. They're falling down rabbit holes of, you know, all sorts of different culture war issues um, and are unable to... They're trapped. They're, they're trapped in a culture war. It's all they think about to the extent that I know people who've lost their families, they've lost their loved ones over it, mm -hmm. they've lost all of their work, and they're just trapped in this sort of circular thinking of, you know, I'm fighting the war, I'm fighting the war. Mm. Very dysfunctional. Mm. And I think, I wonder if, and, and this sort of links a little bit to, to, to Things Fell Apart as well, where you talk about the, the origins of the culture wars, right? Mm. And thinking about Carol's kind of origin story, you know, I wonder if one of the ways that we pierce through this and try to, uh, I don't know, if, if it's possible to make progress on this group of people who we have kind of lost over the last couple of years, yeah. understanding origin stories, understanding what it is that took them there in the first place has got to be important, right? That's got to be yes, because the thing is, when the flame is burning hot, well, I think in some ways it's a lost, it's a slightly lost cause, I think, because one thing I wanted to do and things fell apart is say, look, this is why, you know, we're fighting these battles. And it's, and it's the last thing you'd expect. Some kid, some 19-year-old kid growing up in the Swiss Alps wants to uh, make a showreel. He wants to be a Hollywood director and he wants a showreel to show Hollywood producers. So he convinces his father to let him make a documentary series. His father's an art historian. They put some abortion scenes in there just for, like, arresting visual images for his kid's Hollywood ambition. Mm. That directly leads to Christian evangelists who, are, who weren't interested in abortion for five years after Roe versus Wade um, becoming, like, you know, really interested in abortion, which leads to uh, abortion doctors being murdered. Direct, I'm not talking about a crooked path, I'm talking about a direct path. Yeah. Leads to, like, abortion doctors being murdered, which leads then to the repeal of Roe versus Wade, yeah. like, years later, all because this kid... Um, or because this kid had an ambition to make Hollywood movies. Now, I thought, if I can tell these stories, people are going to, like, wake up, like, oh, my God, we're being manipulated by these faraway people with strange agendas, yeah. which is what happens all the time on social media with, you know, the, the creators of the algorithms and yeah. so on. We're being prodded at by people for money-making reasons. Uh, as I said in my book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, you know, when we're tearing somebody apart... The only people not making any money out of it is us. Yeah. We're like unpaid shaming interns for Google and Twitter. Yeah. Uh, I thought, well, if I explain this to people through storytelling, they'll wake up. But no, because when the flame is burning hot, when you're like immersed in it, yeah. you don't care. So you don't you think you there. don't think that that pierces the the facade and... no i don't think so you can't tell anyone anything people people have to come to it themselves i've had people uh a number of times when my book so you've been publicly shamed came out and there was a bit of a backlash from people um some of those people subsequently were shamed realized how horrible it was and then like emailed to say like sorry that i slagged you off on my radio show it's happened to me now and i know that you were right. right so that's how people change when they when they you know when it happens to them right when that suddenly that sort of empathy for others is thrust upon them because they they're shoving they shoved into that situation yeah so. empathy to a great extent for, with some people well this is interesting like if somebody is horribly bullied i think one of one of two things happens uh they either yes they become more empathetic because our empathy grows with maturity, I think, with, you know, if we're vulnerable, then we become more empathetic to other vulnerable people and we're less hierarchical, that person's nuts, because now we're a bit nuts. Right, yeah. Or you just lash out. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. I think a lot of people just lash out. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's interesting and also quite uh, disheartening, isn't it? The idea that... Because I, I actually sort of thought, well, the logic that, that you apply in... Um, in things fell apart, and and to a degree in the in the debutante as well, is and, and with her origin story and, and, and the way that you tell the story, that that logic will help. It will pierce. It will pierce the facade. But but actually, mm. I suppose there's an, another broadcaster has a really good turn of phrase in which he said people weren't logicked into the situations that they're in, and so right. therefore they're not going to be logicked out of them. Yeah, yeah, it's true. He's a rival broadcaster, so I won't I won't name him. <laughs> but it's a really good point that you made. Yeah, but the truth is that you know we are being manipulated by tech utopians, libertarians. Uh, the inventors of the algorithms, the echo chambers, the advertisers. We are being manipulated mm. and we don't seem to care. <laughs> uh, it's so powerful 
Yeah, yeah we don't the know dopamine, it's happening. the we, dopamine hit of the echo chamber. Yeah, people love you know to to have you know to to be in a world where other people praise you for the things that you do. It's it's very hard. you know. There's an awful lot of I, I, as a writer, I often say I, I um, recommend a book which I actually haven't ever read, so I don't know if it's quite <laughs> good or not. Uh, it'd be a bit of a busman's holiday to read it. It's a book called. Um, Mistakes were made, but not by me. And it's a book written by the man who invented an awful lot of, or, not, or, or recognised an awful lot of the cognitive biases, confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance. These things that, that spellbind and hypnotise us and we don't even know it. Confirmation bias, I'm sure everybody knows this at this stage, but yeah. your confirmation bias is, is you pick up the information that confirms your pre-existing ideology and then you just ignore the information that doesn't. Yeah. Um, which is why, I know I'm going all over the place here, but it's why I'm always a little bit suspicious of ideology-driven journalism. Because journalism should be curious and open-minded. And, you, 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 know, you, you know, you can change your mind halfway through the story and the thing that you thought was true isn't true. Yeah. But more ideological journalism... Uh, you 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 set out with a story that you want to tell, yeah. and then you ignore all the things that you ignore all the nuances. Yeah, yeah. Hold that thought. I'll come back to that. Cause I've got some questions on that point. So, I, I also just on the on the issue of the uh, of the algorithms, the dopamine hit, the the construct of places like Twitter. Mm. I know you're kind of on Twitter a bit less, mm. or you're tweeting a bit less. Um, although you're, you're still you're still on Twitter, right? you still use Twitter like uh, only, daily or only. To, I I go on it to read it. I look daily right but i tweet almost never now uh, only to only to promote my stuff okay. only to sell tickets and so what kind of impact has that had on you um well i just some people are very good to i met years ago I, um a, a famous comedian was talking about lena dunham to me this is when twitter first started and he said you know lena dunham's got like a hit show on on HBO, girls, you know, she gets to express herself in this, this beautiful, nuanced way. And then she like, ruins it all by being like an idiot on Twitter. Right. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah. so many people are that. I mean, my God, don't meet your heroes. Like, don't follow your heroes on Twitter. Yeah. The fact is, there's some people who are very good at tweeting. And they're the only people who really should be right. on, on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's, it just doesn't do us any favours. Yeah. Um, and if you're if you're kind of blessed to be able to tell stories and to, you know, write books and so on, you know, don't ruin it. I got to the stage where, partly through my own mistakes, through tweeting stupid things, I just started to feel, like, repulsed by Twitter, like Malcolm McDowell in A Clockwork Orange after he's been through the Ludovico technique. Like, right. I'd feel, like, physically sick right. <laughs> right. by Twitter. So so I was still... Because, because of what you were seeing or because of the way that it was making you feel when you were... When you were hitting sand. The whole thing. There was like, well, you know, yeah, the whole experience of how it promotes conflict yeah. and, and outrage and, you know, non-nuanced thinking. And and right at the beginning, I had a sort of, I had a bit of a utopian idea about Twitter uh, at the very beginning. It was actually Graham Linehan who, who's really lost himself um, uh, to the algorithms who first told me to go on Twitter. He said, Twitter is a place where no one fights. Yeah, that was like 2010. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah. and I actually had a kind of slightly utopian idea about Twitter, which was it was a place where people could be unselfconscious. Mm -hmm. You could tweet banalities about mm -hmm. what you just had for breakfast. And it reminded me a little bit of like a, an old Robert Altman movie where all these lives would like come onto your yeah. Twitter feed. And these, you know, S Stephen Fry with a million followers, somebody with 50 followers. And I thought it was wonderful. Nobody was trying hard. Yeah. Then what happened was that like... I think, you know, the mainstream media... Let's say Arrived. The, yeah. yeah. And their first thought was, we'll, we'll ignore it and it'll go away. Yeah. But then it didn't go away. So then the mainstream media thought, we're going to control it. So we're going to run these articles of who are the 10 best tweeters. Yeah. And like, number one is Catelyn Moran. Right. And then everybody's like, oh my God, now I have to be performative. Yeah. And that's when the rot set in. Yeah. When, every, when it was no longer... You know, we were all Eve after we'd eaten the apple. We no longer wanted to be naked. Yeah. So that's what happened. It became very performative. So it lost its its original... You know, ask a psychiatrist what's 
best for our mental health. It's being able to admit shameful secrets about ourselves and other people say, oh my God, I'm exactly the same. Yeah. But very quickly it turned into the hunt being on for shameful secrets. Yeah, that, that, was, what it, that was what it was about. I remember that. I remember it being, I remember it being utopia. Yeah. I remember it being a kind place where you could go and be... There was, there was, a, there was a saying that was kicking around at the time, uh, which is absolutely no longer applies, but, the, but people used to say that Facebook was where you would go... Uh, uh, Facebook was sort of full of people that you knew and didn't like. Yeah. Facebook is where you would on. lie to your friends. Right, yes. And Twitter is where you tell the truth to strangers. Right, yes, exactly, yeah. And yeah. I think when that phrase was invented, now it's got a different meaning. Like, you tell the truth to strangers, I said, you're a terrible person. Yeah. But when that phrase was invented, the truth was the truth about yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, so it's partly because the legacy media, like a like a nerdy kid sucking up to the school bully, decided to, like, suck up to Twitter. Yeah. That happened. Also, we fell in love with our shaming power. I mean, this is what So You've Been Publicly Shamed, my book is about. We, we fell in love. At first, the shamings were righteous. LA Fitness, it was like corporations that were being unpleasant to their, you know, members. So, for instance, um, the first Twitter shaming I remember was a heavily pregnant woman who LA Fitness wouldn't allow her to stop her membership. Yes, I remember that. Yes. Right. Yes. So she complained on Twitter. We all piled it on LA we went Fitness. Mad. Yeah. 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 And you know, right away LA Fitness capitulated. Yeah. And we thought, whoa, <laughs> we never had this power before. So then but then of course we started to fall in love with our power too much. And instead of corporations that had transgressed, it was private individuals who had misspoken. Yeah. <laughs> like Just a day without a shaving felt like a day treading water yeah and justine sacco happened yes she was the yeah the ground zero of public shaming and mm. i was on twitter that night that was the night i really decided to write my book because she was um and I'm, to this day i'm still the only person ever to interview her yeah she um she's at heathrow about to go to cape town she's got 170 twitter followers comes up with what she thinks is a is a joke mocking her own privilege a liberal joke mocking her own privilege going to africa hope i don't get aids just kidding i'm white mm. so then she like chuckled to herself thought like yeah. never got never got a reply because she never got any replies she was a bad comedian in an empty room right. <laughs> gets on the plane yeah. <laughs> falls asleep wakes up you know eight hours later or ten hours later in cape town turns on her phone and straight away there's a text from somebody that she hadn't spoken to since high school that said I am so sorry to see what's happening to you right now. And then she's like, and then another text from her best friend, you need to phone me right now. You are the worldwide number one trending topic on Twitter. And yeah, I mean, things got so frenzied when she was asleep. The thing that made me think this is terrible is that she was asleep and oblivious to the whole thing. And that was just hilarious to people. Yeah. It was like, you know, the... They were tracking her flight. I remember yeah. that. I remember that night. I remember people, per, people posting flight trackers. That yeah, night. somebody linked to a flight tracker website and yeah. a hashtag started trending worldwide. Hashtag has Justine landed yet. Yeah. And everybody from, you, you know, caring social justice people through to like misogynistic trolls through to Donald Trump, uh, all united that night yeah. in, in uh, tearing her to shreds. Uh, the worst of all of them, I'd say, was the hipsters. Wow. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm in this bar, I'm dying to go home, but I can't until Justine Sacco, I can't look away until right. Justine Sacco lands. Because at least, you know, I think if you kind of compared like the misogynistic Nazi trolls to the hipsters, at least the Nazi trolls believe in something. <laughs> <laughs> the hipsters don't believe in anything. Just... <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess what that that story speaks to two things. And again, another theme in the in the, the debutant, which is, I mean, I mean, obviously the, the 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 horror of public shaming and the way that those kind of platforms uh, began to encourage that kind of behaviour, right, and and reward um, mm. that that kind of shit, that that sort of uh, massive shaming pylon. But also, and I suppose present in Justine Sacco's story. All, the, all of your work, really, is the human complexity yeah. and how complicated and flawed people are. People are such... People are yeah. so grey. We're a mess. We're good and we're bad. We're clever and stupid. Heroes do villainous things and vice versa. Yeah. And Twitter 
um, you know, became a stage for constant artificial high drama where everybody's either a you know, magnificent hero or a sickening villain and nothing in between. And that's obviously not true about humans. Yeah, there's like this worldwide self-delusion. And, you know, we're talking about Twitter, but it's infiltrated, you know, it's impacted everything. It's impacted the world. Twitter is small, but its influence, you know, in terms of the way that we perceive each other. Yeah. Is, is vast, it's world changing. And yeah, so there's that mass self delusion where we're all pretending to ourselves. So that's not the truth about people. Yeah. Do you think, I'm going to, I hope this isn't a difficult question and feel, just feel free if you don't want to answer it. But, but Graham Linen, who you talk about, and I think he was kind of very much part of the origin story of the series of origin stories, right? As far as things yeah. fell apart are concerned. I, I always try and, like, when I'm, you know, embarking on a big project, I always try and. You know, I always think, is it, does this have anything to do with my personal life, like my private life? Because I think you're going to be more passionate and curious about telling a story if if you have some personal reason for doing it. Yes. And you you, you and Graham fell out quite publicly. And yeah. There was lots of tweets and stuff. And other things. And obviously he has taken the path that he's taken and he's back on Twitter now, of course. Mm. And so back posts and stuff. Do you think that, um, is is he sort of... I mean, this might be a stupid question, really, but is he worthy of the empathy and trying to understand him and the complexity of him and his origin story? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, definitely. I mean, everybody does that interest you? Oh, yeah, in him. Yes, yeah. If I was John Osborne in the sixties, I'd be writing a play about <laughs> Graham. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I'm utterly fascinated, and face obviously face sad. I mean, I don't want to fall out with people. I don't thrive on conflict. And he's tweeted about me, you know, thousands of times. Over, I've got to say, over very little. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, our, our falling out was me telling him that I thought that he'd been acting like a bully. And that, that was it. That was the entirety of it. And as a result of that, I've had literally thousands of tweets about, you know, I'm a misogynistic bully and I'm complicit in murders committed by trans people. And... Uh, and of course, all the you know people who don't realise what the origin of it was, which was me telling him I thought he was acting like a bully, think that I don't know I'm nailing dead rats to the door of yeah. rape crisis centres or something. Right. All I did was say that I thought he was acting like a bully. Right, right. Yeah. Is there a redemption arc there, available to him? Uh, oh God, yeah. Um, I, well, I mean, I think Graham really escalates things a lot. You know, it, I mean, it's his choice to to behave the way that he does. But for me, there's an awful lot of gender critical people out there who are having. You know, I know that the I know that there's a lot of disproportionate punishment of of people with gender critical beliefs. That's that's undoubted, and you know, it, it can get a little. You know, it can get weird. I would also say though that there's an awful lot of people out there, like say Helen Lewis who's having like a very good career and and it's you know it, it's so you have to also think well how are they conducting themselves in public right and the fact is you know graham is is exceptionally belligerent and so it's not just his beliefs it's also his methodology yeah 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 it's, I, it's the reason why you know things are not going well for him career-wise yeah right and and there's I don't, have, have you been following the philip schofield story oh yeah because i keep thinking about you in this as well and and mm. this sort of and, and there's a lot of public public shaming stuff in there right i and I'm, I'm fascinated because i can't quite figure out exactly how it fits into that but i feel like it does my gut tells me it does um <laughs> i i don't know enough what what i did learn when i was um writing so you've been publicly shamed because obviously after shamed came out i became like Mr. Shame. Yeah, yeah. My friend John Safran said I was, I'd become a shaming imam. Right, That yeah. people would come to me Everybody to adjudicate. <laughs> yes. yeah. You're the arbiter of <laughs> yeah. whether someone's so, been publicly yeah. yeah, so to be honest, I, yeah. I made a decision pretty early on that I would only comment on things where I had done my own research, you know, I'd yeah. properly thought about it, met the people... Um, because there's so much nuance in it. There's so much complexity. Yeah. All and, of those stories. Are yeah, of all of, and quite often the information's wrong. I mean, the number of times we've torn somebody to shreds so and then two days later it turns out that they hadn't done the thing that we thought they'd done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. That happens all the time. I could give you countless examples. Yeah. But, um, so, so I don't think I can 
comment yeah, yeah. on it because I just haven't done any independent research. What you do do though is is um, is is sort of span America and, and the UK, and you kind of bounce between the two. And obviously, you're in the UK now, but you live in you live in New York. Yeah. What what? How do you reflect on the sort of on on the differences in terms of the culture wars and and the way that um, the way that the sort of climate is between those mm. between those two countries? It's interesting. For for the longest time, the whole gender critical stuff, for instance, was very much the domain of Great Britain. Um, and it's only really very recently come to America. Like there was articles in the New York Times, as I guess in about 2018, saying, you know, why, you know, we just don't get it. Like why? Mm. And but now it's very much become part of the United States. Uh, I don't see enormous. A lot of the culture was a lot of the origin moments, like the pebbles thrown in the pond. I think begin in, in the United States, but I don't see an enormous difference. I think culturally, you know, no. I mean, you know. Um, Culture wars are being politicised by nefarious people with their own personal agendas of wanting power in both countries, I'd say. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's happening in a very obvious way in the United States with, you know, the rise of Ron DeSantis. I'd say the very small and hopefully not particularly long-lasting rise of Ron DeSantis. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, so I don't see enormous. I don't think. I mean, if you if you're more specific, I mean, I, right now I don't see like enormous differences. I mean, there's a, there's a bit of an argument that, it, that 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 I suppose it's sort of tearing America apart, mm. certainly politically, and maybe maybe because it's got to the top of politics in America in a way that it hasn't quite here. I mean, I, I, mm. you know, I mean, I, maybe I see... yeah, maybe. Although you know, I don't know. I mean, that question, what is a woman? Um, it is becoming a sort of political purity test in the United Kingdom too. Right. Um, I, so I don't know. I, I think it's... I mean, look, I, I spend more time in America, but I do listen to an awful lot of BBC sounds. Like, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm across what's happening in Britain. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I, I, it seems pretty sort of all-consuming. In some ways, all-consuming in both countries, but also maybe not. Like, for instance, Ron DeSantis is making a very big run, you know, for, for being like the culture war president. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to work. Right. Uh, because I think, you know, in the end, most people care more about economics than, than about culture. Right. You know, the culture war is basically defined as any war that doesn't involve economics. Right. Um, and I think economics will, will, will win the day. You know, Florida is where woke goes to die and all of this stuff. Right, right. I think, you know, one thing I like about American conservatives is that they tend not to be authoritarians and so that I don't think they're going to vote somebody like Ron DeSantis in right okay yeah that's very interesting um, I'm trying to figure out where to get back to uh, LM City and I don't oh. really know how to do that now. Just, you, you already <laughs> have <laughs> um, uh, because because I want, I want to I want to uh, uh, take us there because it's sort of central to the story um, mm. it's a of the debutante of the debutante yes mm. uh, it's a fascinating a fascinating place and um, and somewhere that so, so I, I mean how, I mean, perhaps, perhaps it's worth explaining how it fits into the story and how yeah. Carol uh, Carol ended uh, Carol ended up there, and, and and talk about perhaps your experience of being of oh being yeah there as well. Oh, it's amazing. So basically, Carol Howe was a, a leading neo Nazi for a few months. She became like an Aryan goddess spokeswoman for the white race, mainly because she started dating Dennis Mayhan, the man behind Dial a Racist, and he wanted to get her on Oprah. These were the days when it was quite easy to get white supremacists onto mainstream TV, like, you know, yeah. Jerry Springer or Oprah, you know, they kind of loved it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, he got her on German TV, he didn't get her on Oprah. But after a few months, she said that he assaulted her and the... ATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, found out and invited her to become an undercover informant. So she went back in, but this time wearing a wire. And the place where they were most interested in her going was this place called Elohim City. Elohim City really is an extraordinary place. It's a very eccentric but very serious and dangerous, well, historically serious and dangerous, compound in the Arkansas uh, Ozark Mountains, Oklahoma, Arkansas border. Like a lot of white supremacist murderers have hidden hidden out at Elohim City over the years. So it's a serious place. So Cal was there very heroically. I mean, there's a lot about Cal's story where I think she doesn't behave quite so heroically. But at this period, she does. She's there. She's not wearing a wire. She's spying on Elohim City, writing a diary, which I managed to get hold of amazingly, of yeah. you know, that she would send to, to the ATF. Um, now... Um, and I went there. Yeah. 
Um, was that right? But that would that would have been in the nineties, yeah. would it? So yes. would that would have been that would would that have been around the time that she was there? No, I was. I went about two years later. Right. Okay. Right. And because I'd heard all these rumours about the place, and I wanted to see it for myself. Right. Right. And I turned up, and and you know, for all of the, you know, violent, peep young men who would hang out there, when I arrived, all the children of the community put on a performance of River Dance to welcome me. Right. <laughs> And then they got me to tell funny stories about myself. I had to stand there and do like a bit. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, which Carol did too in her diary right. in the same room. Right. Uh, is that yeah. a bit disoriented? I mean, you're going to a place that, frankly, is full of people who like... Hate Jews. Hate you, right? Yeah. yeah they sort of ideologically despise you. And yeah. And then you're being gre- greeted by River Dunn. So yeah. was that, uh, it must be a bit jarring, a bit of a jarring experience. It's always a bit jarring, yeah. But, but I think the honest truth is when I'm out, like, gathering my material... The material gathering is so important that I kind of put my personal safety to one side because I just know. You know, my friend Louis Threw was asked this question one time, like, why do you do it? And he said, because not doing it is worse. Mm. And it's true, when you're back at home, and which is the part of the process that I actually enjoy, yeah. um, you know, whittling away and turning it into a story, if you don't get the material, you know, you're screwed back at home. So, yeah. Yeah, I do remember I'm haunted by an image from my childhood of, uh, it was on the news and a cameraman was in a war zone and he filmed his own death. Like he, he films a, um, uh, a sniper turning the gun on him and shoots and, and, and he dies. Wow. Yeah, and I've, um, you know, we do need to be careful. Like when we're behind the camera, we're still humans yeah. who can be killed. But you do forget that sometimes when you're out you know, in those dangerous places. But I also think, I'm probably not the first person to observe this, but I also get the sense that you that you are drawn to those places, right? I think there was, a, I've, I've wrote something down that you said something along the lines of you are, um, you're just always fascinated by, you're automatically fascinated by people who hate you or something like that. <laughs> well, you, you, true. And also, but mainly I think I'm really fascinated by places, getting into places where you're not supposed to go, get into. Right. I remember uh, when I was writing my book, The Psychopath Test, I spent some time at Broadmoor, yeah. uh, Broadmoor Hospital, and I remember saying to a nurse, I was sitting there, and I turned to the nurse and I said, oh, God, I'm so, I feel so lucky being here. And the nurse like, gave me this funny look and said, uh, said, well, we've got a spare bed if you like. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, yeah. Tempting. <laughs> I mean, that's the best thing about journalism is that you get to go to places where people like us aren't supposed to go. What does it do to your sense of self and your your faith in humanity? You know, it was shaken a little bit. Most of my books before So You've Been Publicly Shamed were about abuses of power that were happening in strange, faraway places. The so psychopath test is like, you know, uh, psychopaths in positions of power. And The Men Hysteric Goats was about the village, you know, faraway places. Yeah, yeah. So you've been publicly shamed was was about abuses of power committed by us, by nice people like us. Yeah, yeah. And that shook my faith in humanity a little bit more than the other ones did. Just the casual cruelty, the tricks we play on ourselves to, you know, destroy somebody when they're asleep on a plane and oblivious to it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That yeah that definitely made me made, made it hard for me to see an, an upside. Right. Um, Carol was a very good informant. Yes, and I guess but you know a big part of the story, and I, I'm sort of like slightly hesitant to 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 really spend too much time drilling into it because I think it's I think uh, you tell it so brilliantly in this in the debutant mm. that I think it's worth just listening to and going on that journey mm. with you as you go on that journey. Well, thank you. Um, but the crux of it, of course, is, is this big question: is is did uh, did the Oklahoma bomber, did Timothy McVeigh, did he work alone, and could Carol have perhaps uncovered? Yeah a group of people who were responsible. Yeah, it's specifically because of this Elohim City diary that she kept. Yeah. Because, and I will say this, Pat, um, there are some mysteries, like even a sceptic like me. I went on Joe Rogan a few years ago. Somebody reminded me of this quite recently. I went on Joe Rogan a few years ago, and, he, and I, I, from memory, he said something like, you know, you're such a sceptic. Are there any conspiracy theories you believe in? And I said, well, you know, maybe this one. Because the fact is... Timothy McVeigh, who always swore that he didn't know anything about Elohim City, no real connection whatsoever. He acted alone in committing the worst act of domestic terrorism in American history. Uh, he got a park, he got a traffic ticket very close to the very remote Elohim City. Mm-hmm. He 
definitely telephoned Elohim City and asked to speak to Andy the German. Now, Andy the German was a man who Carol was, you know, particularly spying on for the government. Yeah. She writes in her diary at one point, I have secured an intimate personal relationship with Andy and I am now his girlfriend. <laughs> I, I, I don't think her handlers reined her in as far as I can tell. There is a, there's a side story about how Cavalier, uh, the, the American government, and quite possibly in Britain too, are towards our young undercover informants, mm. sending them on very dangerous missions mm. with, you know, no training. Mm. And that was true of Carol. And she was, as you said, she was a very good informant. And, uh, um, to cut a long story very, very short, there are sightings in strip clubs, a strip club called Lady Godiva, where people swore that they saw Timothy McVeigh with Andy the German 10 days before the bombing. And McVeigh says to, to the woman, I'm a very smart man. You're going to remember me on April 19th, 95. You're going to remember me for the rest of your life. So you put all of those things together, which mm -hmm. I do at the end of, I think, of episode four. And you think, well, of course, you know, there's no way that this isn't true. But then in episodes five and six, I dig into it a lot more. Did, did you, I mean, because, I mean, you know, it, it is, a, in a sense, in many ways, a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. um, and it's clearly, it's clearly sort of lingered with you over the years because you've been working on this story for a long time and you worked on this story... In the 90s. In the 90s, right, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I met Dennis Mahan. I, you know, I met all sorts of, like, key figures. I went to Elohim City. Yeah. Yeah. Has it, has it influenced the way that you think of other conspiracy theories? Um... Uh, yes, and it's what I said right at the beginning of this conversation. Um, the and I, I want to try and say this without giving too much away about the plot of the debutant. Yeah. But we think of conspiracy theorists as being on the right, you know, QAnon and you know, political and religious extremists, and the people who believe in this Carol Howe theory that you, you know she could have prevented the Oklahoma City bombing if she'd only been listened to aren't people on the right. They're either mainstream reporters, like, you know, eminent journalists from NBC, or academics and historians on the left who are convinced that, you know, civil war is imminent, um, the far right are full of white supremacists. They're not just anti-government activists, but they're also white supremacists who are, like, plotting. Um, and Carol Howe's story proves it. Um, if she don't, you know, proves that, that Timothy McVeigh wasn't a lone wolf. Yeah, right. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And if that is a conspiracy theory, then it shows that, you know, ideologically driven thought is not that far away from conspirac conspiratorial thinking. Right. Uh, and it happens on the left as well. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, um, and, 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 I guess that sort, and I guess that sort of trying to one thing that's sort of really hard, I think, to try to, to try to navigate through is finding those um, is separating when when that ideological journalism is constructed and when it's when it's kind of legitimate and mm. activism journalism. Oh, as a, sure, I, yes, absolutely, I'm, and I'm glad you said that because I'm not like I'm not against ideological journalism and I'm not against activist journalism. In fact, I'm I've done it myself and I'm and I'm for it. And but I think a it 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 should be labelled correctly. Yeah. Like, we should know that we're reading activist journalism. And B, there's a small strain, I don't want to go too over the top about this, but I'd say there's a small train of thought within the world of ideological journalism that, that the kind of journalism that I mostly do, which is nuanced, looking at every side of the story, trying to tell complicated human stories, is is bad and wrong and should be stopped. Right. And uh, And I don't feel that way about them so i so i don't think that they should feel that way about the kind of journalism that i do right and, and I, I say yeah i think yeah, you can over you know i don't want to like become a culture warrior it doesn't happen but you know but you do see it it's funny uh, i was uh, there's a guy in australia called john safran who's very much a kind of australian version of like, you know of what of what i do and what louis theroux does and i had lunch with him in, in a couple of weeks ago and he said have you noticed how me you and Louis don't really get very much criticism. Like, you know, people don't say, oh, you know, these big both sides things. They're, you know, we don't right. get the criticism. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, I have noticed that. Like, why not? 
and he, he said, well, I think we've been, we've been grandfathered in. Right, right. <laughs> and, and also, sometimes we're used as cudgels to attack over the people. Like, I hate that journalist. He doesn't do it in the nuanced way that, you know, right, yeah. John Safran or Louis Thru or whatever does it. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, so I think, yeah. I think we just got lucky. We slipped through the cracks. I did a, I did a thing a couple of months ago where right. I, went, I went to, um, and forgive me, for talk, uh, forgive me for talking about something that was on the show, but... Um, I went to spend some time with the amateur sleuths and detectives who were trying to find a missing woman in the right. north of England. There's a really big story over here. It may, it may pass you by in New York. Oh no! Oh no! I do no no. I, I followed the it Nicola very Bullard closely. Yeah, the woman in the in the in the canal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She she ended up uh, she fell in the lake. I think eventually is what is what uh, in, in, right. in the river is what they're thinking. Yeah. But for for it was a, it was a mystery for for about a fortnight or so. Nobody knew what happened to her. The story grew legs. It was massive. It was huge. And it attracted these. Uh, it attracted people who were basically there filming TikTok content, mm. right? Who went along to film TikTok with it. So I went along and spent a day on the scene of this disappearance to try to find these people and to try to unpick their motives, right? Quite Ron esque trying to you know figure right. out who these people are and what their motivations are and what's going on. And very quickly, he was able to. I mean, I met one guy who. Um, who was um, who was one of the most prolific TikTok sleuths? He was getting tens of thousands of views, hundreds of thousands of comments. You know, this guy was huge uh, around this story. He was kind of one of the main sources of TikTok content around this disappearance. Mm. He got arrested actually by the police because of uh, because of tr- you know, trampling through people's gardens and all that sort of stuff. And of, uh, only over the course of a couple of hours with him, came to learn that his his sister had died in mysteri- in the circumstances that he felt there were needed answers. Wow. And so he was clearly looking for a bit of closure in his life. And um, and also he was talking about feeling like a lone sheep and that he had lost sheep and that, you know, he was clearly struggling with his sense of purpose, with his place in the world. Add, the, mm. add a TikTok algorithm and the dopamine hit of having hundreds of thousands of people commenting on your stuff all the time, yeah. you've got no chance. The human versus machine equation <laughs> there, the human's not got, doesn't stand a chance, does yeah, it? Yeah, really? absolutely. But I got a lot of criticism. But the point I was going to make is I got a lot of criticism for that. People were... People, oh, for humanising it. Yeah, for, human, for being there, actually, I suppose. Yeah, in a set, yeah. Right. Yeah, well, sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's the same thing again, right? In the same way that, you know, ideological-driven journalism can veer into conspiratorial thinking, exactly the same with, with true crime sleuths. Um, yeah. True crime podcasters and TikTokers. It's exactly the same thing. We're, we're, it's 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 the same thing. You know, we attack. You know, we think that QAnon are nuts, but we act just like them in different ways all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. One, one of the other people who, who who I bumped into said, sort of said, you know, I, I, I went when I when I first arrived there, I spoke to another journalist who, and I said, oh, have you seen any of these TikToks? I'm here to talk to the TikTok people. And he said, oh yeah, you want to talk to those people over there? He pointed at a group of girls. And he said, "You want to talk to the grief junkies over there?" I thought that was that's a right. brilliant turn of phrase that yeah. right around. So I went to speak to them. I said, "Oh, you know," um, and I put that to them. I said, "You, you know, you're, you're, you're you people, you know, are referring to you as, as grief junkies. You're here to rubberneck to have a look." And they pointed at the bank of cameras and journalists, <laughs> all from mainstream outlets, and said, "Well, what are they? Then? What about them? Well, yeah." And that you know, there's the there undeniable truth in that, isn't it? Very true. You know, the, the democratization of journalism and and you know, public discourse with the rise of social media. Mm. I think, you know, ought to shake the confidence of, you know, those of us in the high tower. Yeah. Because it shows, I, I, was, I, I think I said, th- I said this the other day, that, that um, you know, I, people like us who make money out of writing, then you go on Twitter and non-writers uh, can be very eloquent. You mm. can read a thread by somebody with 60 Twitter followers uh, that's as good as writing as you're paid to do. Mm-hmm. Um so yes, that that kind of democratization of it, it causes terrible, terrible problems. You know, when people aren't trained, and well, that was my point was that you know yeah. my content's going to be listened to by a lawyer, and mm. ultimately, if it goes wrong, then Ofcom will have a conversation. And I suppose yes. it is different. It is different in that. It's respect. different in that way, but they're not entirely wrong no, to point not. at the bank of cameras. No, they're not. They're really not. <laughs> um, okay, I've got I've got one more question for you because I know you've got the rest of your life to go on with. So. Um, <laughs> But there was there, somebody asked a really great question of you um, uh, um, over the weekend that I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to nick it if that's all right because I think it's a really great question that I, that I really wanted to have a bit more of a conversation with you about, which was, um, are you trying to reflect the world or influence it mm. in what you do? Yeah, it's a re- I mean, it's a it's a it was a really good question. Um, I think you have to be you know you'd have to be pretty hubristic to think I want to change the world. I'm doing this to change the world. So I always set out 
thinking I'm going to reflect the world. But then once in a while, I veer into a territory where I get very morally indignant about something and then just like, I'm going to try and change the world too, which that happened in Say Being Publicly Shamed. Like, I really felt... The night of Justine Sacco, the night of the AIDS tweet, mm. I really did think I was, I was seeing something that other people weren't seeing. Um, you know, that something had shifted in the culture, like this was terrible. I wasn't the only one. In fact, Helen Lewis, who I mentioned earlier, she that night tweeted something like, can we not just wait for her plane to land to hear what she has to say for herself, you know, right. to explain her joke. <laughs> yeah, and she's, she's reasonable. Yeah. yeah, and people were just immediately, well, you're just a privileged bitch too. Right, yeah. So she just, she, she shut up. So, uh, so, I was, so I wasn't the only one, but we were definitely in the minority. So that was a night where I thought, okay, I'm I am ahead of, I'm ahead of like most people's thinking here. Yeah. And so on an occasion like that, I thought, yes, you know, I, I I strongly feel that we should be treating each other with curiosity and patience and empathy, and you know, be aware of other people's you know complexities. Uh, and I want to try and convince people of this. Yeah. So, so I suppose so, so. The answer is like I don't ever set out to try and change the world, but you know, once in a while I get into an area where I sort of do you know do my best. But I, I also suppose that that in reflecting the world, you change it as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. Um, I mean, you hold a mirror up to to people. Yeah. And pe- and their behaviour. And, and we have, have to be, plans. yeah, and we have to be. This is, actually, I saw Roman, oh God, what's his name? Um, Ron, Ronan Farrow. Yeah. I, I saw him do an event with my friend Fenton Bailey in New York recently. And, and he said, the other thing, because he, obviously he pretty much broke me too. I was yeah. one of the two or three people that broke me too. Mm. And he said, in a way we have to kind of be almost like, I can't remember his phrase, but it's like talent spotters. Like, you know, because the stories we decide to tell are really important and, and, um, you are sort of thinking you're a little bit like like the Simon Cowell of public thought. Yeah. You're thinking, what will people want to read about next? So, so those factors are in there too. And so, in in my book, them, I think I early on thought, okay, I've just noticed a connection between political and religious extremism and conspiratorial thinking. Mm. That feels like something I should like give the world yeah. and in the psychopath test it was the same thing like everybody suddenly you know I, i'm really interested in the idea that there's a particular mental disorder which happens to be the worst mental disorder in the whole world psychopathy yeah and all of these like eminent psychologists are saying that's the one that rules the world like psychopathy rules because you're much more likely to find a psychopath at the top of the tree than, than at the bottom so again i thought you know that's an important that's like an important thing to like give the world so yeah. so yeah i'd say reflecting it can possibly affect change yeah um it's been a real pleasure Daryl, you too it, I, it was great genuinely quite a big moment for me uh to had to be in your company uh i've read everything you've ever written i've listened to everything it's borderline unhealthy probably um uh, but, but i yeah, i'm an enormous enormous fan of your work and um um, thank you for being so generous with your time oh, and my... generous with your journalism. It's it's just it's such a, it's an, it is genuinely an incredible gift to the world. Oh, oh that is so kind. You know, we spend ninety five percent of our lives alone in a room, panicking. <laughs> so to get a nice bit of praise like that is lovely. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. And the debutant is really brilliant. It's on uh, Audible, so people listen to it there now. Yep, uh, yep, yep, yep. It's on Audible. It's only on Audible. Everything else we talked about is available everywhere but the debutante is only on Audible. And I can't recommend it enough. Um, John Ronson, thank you. Thank you, Dale.